Today we continue to listen Sila Vanda Sutta. In this Sutta, Venerable Makutika asks question to Venerable Sariputra. What are the things that a virtuous monk should carefully attend to? A Venerable Sariputra answer. Aumsa Kutika, a virtuous monk should carefully attend to the five aggregates subject to clinging as impermanent, as suffering, as a disease, as a tumor, as empty, uh, as non-self, as that, as misery, as affliction, etc. So according to this uh, answer, according to this teaching, when we practice meditation, we have to observe the five aggregates of clinging. And also we observe every phenomena occurring at the six centers. And also we observe every, every, every purchase. So yogi practice mindfulness when walking, when standing, when sitting, and when lying down when bending, stretching, etc. They must sustain mindfulness all, at all times. In whatever position they are in, and the primary posture for mindfulness meditation is sitting with cross legs and also other walking and other activities. Yogi try to be mindful. The practice of mindfulness meditation can be compared to 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 producing fire. If you want to produce fire by, by energetically and continuously rubbing two sticks together so as to, to attain necessary intensity of heat when flame arises. There should be no gaps. There should not be no gaps. If there are gaps between the moments of mindfulness, yogi cannot gain momentum, and so yogi cannot attain concentration. That is why yogi at the retreats are practicing mindfulness all the time that they are awake from the moment they wake up in the morning until they fall asleep at night. And walking meditation and other activities are necessary to the continuous development of mindfulness. So Buddha himself, who first taught walking meditation in the Master Deepachana Sutta, 
Buddha taught walking meditation. In the section called Idiyabhata Posture, Buddha said that a monk knows walking when he is walking, a monk knows standing when he is standing, a monk knows sitting when he is sitting, a monk knows lying down when he is lying down. In another session called Sampazinya, Clear Comprehension, Buddha said, a monk applies clear comprehension in going forward and in going back. Clear comprehension means the correct understanding of what uh, what we observe. To correctly understand what we observe, we must gain concentration, and in order to gain concentration, we must apply mindfulness. Precisely. So when the Buddha said, monks apply clear comprehension, we must understand that not only clear comprehension must be applied, but also mindfulness and concentration. So Buddha was instructing meditators to apply mindfulness, concentration, and clear comprehension while walking and activities. So walking meditation is an important part in this process. Now let us talk specifically about the practice of walking meditation. In the beginning, we try to be mindful of only one thing during walking meditation. To be mindful of the act of stepping while we make a note silently in our mind Stepping, 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 or walking, walking, walking. So yogi may walk at a slower speed than normal during this practice. After a few hours or after After two of meditation, yogis are able to be mindful of two occurrences, two stages. Yogi can discover stepping and putting down the foot. A yogi will try to be mindful of two stages in the step. Stepping, putting down, stepping, putting down. And the most stages you can discover, yogi can be mindful of three stages, lifting, moving, and dropping. Stay later, yogi become more to be mindful of four stages in each step. Lifting, pushing forward, dropping, and pressing. So yogi would become
completely mindful and to make a mental note of these four stages of the food's movement. Lifting, pushing forward, dropping, and pressing. So at first, yogi may find it difficult to slow down, but as yogi are inclined to pay close attention to all the movements, all the movement involved, and as yogi actually pay closer and closer attention, yogi way naturally slow down. Yogi do not have to slow down intentionally, but when Yogi pay closer attention, slowing down comes to you automatically. So if yogis want to pay closer attention to the movements of lifting, moving forward, pushing down and pressing the ground, yogi will naturally slow down. And only when yogi slow down, you can be truly mindful and fully aware of these movements. Although yogis pay close attention to slow down, yogi may not see all the movements and stages clearly. The stages may not yet be well defined in the mind, and yogi may seem to, uh, to see, and these stages may seem to constitute only one continuous movement. Now yogi concentrate more, and when concentration grows stronger, yogi will observe more and more clearly these different stages in one step. The four stages at least may be easier to distinguish. Yogis, we know distantly that the lifting movement is not mixed with the moving forward movement. A yogi will know that the moving forward movement is not mixed with either the lifting movement or the putting down movement. So yogi will understand all movements clearly and distantly because concentration getting strengthened. Whatever yogi are mindful and aware of will be very clear in, in your minds. As yogis carry on the practice, yogi will observe much more when yogi lift the foot, you will experience the lightness of the foot. And when yogi push the foot forward, you will notice the movement from one place to another. And when yogi put the foot down, you will feel the heaviness of the foot because the foot becomes heavier and heavier as it goes down. When yogis put the foot on the ground, yogi will feel the touch of the heel of the foot on the ground. So along with observing, lifting, moving forward, putting down and pressing the ground, 
you will also perceive the lightness of the rising food, the movements of the food, and the heaviness of the descending food, and then touching the touching the food, which is the hardness or softness of the food on the ground. So when you perceive this process, you are perceiving the f elements, especially the four essential elements. These essential elements are elements of earth, elements of water, elements of fire, and elements of air. By paying close attention to these four stages of your walking, these elements in their true essence, you will perceive, not merely as concept, but as actual processy, as ultimate realities. So in the first movement, that is the lifting the food, yogi perceive lightness, and when yogi perceive the process, yogi can yogi can comprehend by yourself. So yogi comprehend that this movement, hardness, softness, and the knowing mind, mind and matter arise in this fear, and yogi understand that these namarupa are impermanent. When yogi see that they are impermanent, yogi needs understand that they are unsatisfactory because all these nama rupa are always oppressed by constant arising and disappearing. After comprehending impermanence and the unsatisfactory nature of nama rupa, Five aggregates, yogi observe that there can be no mastery over these things. That is, yogi realize that there is no self or no soul within that can order them to be permanent. All these namarupa or five aggregates just arise and disappear according to natural law. By comprehending this, yogis comprehend the 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 third characteristics of conditioned phenomena. The characteristics of anatta. The characteristics that namarupa have no self. So it is important to practice diligently and precisely. When yogis see the elements clearly, they lose the concept of a being. Yogis see now that there are just the elements. Elements going, elements standing, elements sitting, elements lying down, elements bending, etc. When yogis see only these elements going, etc., yogi cannot see a person and lose the concept of a being. So 
So the observation of the elements is explained in the soda with the simile. Commentary explain in this way. When a butcher is feeding a cow, he's nourishing it, and then takes it to the slaughtering place, ties it to a post, and case it. He still had the notion that it is a being, it is a cow. If someone would ask him, what are you doing? He would say, I'm feeding the cow or I'm killing the cow. Even after having killed the cow, before he cuts it up into pieces, he still maintains the notion that it is a cow. But when, after cutting the slaughtered cow into pieces, he takes and puts the pieces on a table at the crossroad, from that point on, he loses the notion of a cow. If someone would ask him, what are you selling? He would not say, I'm Sully and Carl. He would not say. So after cutting the cow into pieces, he loses the concept of a cow. In the same way, when yogis cut the aggregates into elements, When you sit, notice sitting, sitting, and you, when your concentration getting better, many elements you discovered, movement, tension, stiffness, a walking meditation, many elements can be discovered. So yogis cut the aggregates on Namaripa into elements, whatever they have, whatever is in the uh, aggregates, are just elements. Then yogi will lose the concept of a being, yogi, yogis will lose the concept of a person. So this meditation was taught by the Buddha to eliminate the concept of there is a being. The simile given should not lead to the conclusion that meditators must conceptualize the elements. The elements taught in Buddhism are in fact not concept, but are parts of what is called paramatta, ultimate reality, which consists of consciousness, mental factors, metta, and nirvana. So when we practice meditation, we need to understand the four concealment of obstacle. The processy which hide impermanence, suffering, and no soul. If we fail to see impermanence, 
because we do not see the arising and disappearing of fire aggregates, and we are tricked by continuity. Continuity hides the nature of impermanence. Continuity santati hides the nature of a nature impermanence. We look at things, we look at our consciousness, and we see them as continuous. When we are, we are not mindful. In order to see impermanence, we must observe closely the arising and disappearing of the five aggregates. We must penetrate by means of concentration and insight, insight developed in meditation. Through the impression of continuity, which acts as a cover of impermanence. Let us think of a ring of fire. Someone has a torch and draws it to create an impression of a circle of fire. But we know, we know that there is really no ring of fire. It is just the impression of individual position of the fire at different places and at different times. But our mind takes the impression as something continuous. Rather, our mind connects the impression and we deceive ourselves. If we could take a moving pictures of the process and watch it at a slow speed, we will see the individual parts of the sequence of the apparent ring of fire. We would only see light at different places and not a circle. If we cannot pinpoint the components of things in order to see them arising and disappearing, we continue to see things, we continue to see fire aggregates as whole entities. So we must observe, we must note, we must have note here that impermanence in this context means momentary impermanence, kana nature. If we drop a cup and it breaks, we say it is impermanent, it is pinyati in nature. Or if a person dies and we see that the person is impermanent, it is pinyati and nature. So impermanence in this context means momentary impermanence. Pinyati in nature, the example of pinyati in nature conceptual impermanence are easy to see. But when we use that term in the context of Vipassana meditation, we mean the constant arising and disappearing of the five aggregates. And this can only be observed during Vipassana meditation. And also in the same way, by dukkha, by suffering, we do not mean ordinary pain or ordinary illness 
We mean the constant oppression by arising and disappearing. And this can also be seen only in vipassana meditation. Even in phenomena we call pleasurable, it is arising and disappearing. Uh, we understand that Dokka nature is concealed by Iriyabhata posture. More specifically, there is always suffering in our body, but we can see that pain by changing posture unmindfully. We can see. That is why Yogi have to sit still, sit very still while they are meditating to discover the nature of dukkha suffering. If yogis avoid changing posture often, they will achieve mindfulness and concentration and they will observe the nature of dukkha directly. and another nature, non-self. Another non-self does not become apparent because it is concealed by gna, compactness. When resolution into the various elements is not given attention, People do not uh, give attention to the resolution into various elements. Here again, there is the notion, the notion of compactness, gna in Pali. In reality, there is no compactness, but we always see things as compact. We always see aggregates as solid things. We think that even our mind is just one solid mind. We think that it is the same as the mind a few moments ago. It is the same as the mind a week ago. It is the same as the mind a month ago, a year ago, etc. And even though we have different minds, different consciousness, when you mindful, you discover uh, different consciousness, seeing consciousness, hearing consciousness, another hearing consciousness, and smelling consciousness, tasting consciousness, touching consciousness, etc. So yogis see them as a, we see them as a solid things. We lump them all together as one. So these aggregates are also concealed by the notion of compactness. In reality, it is not so simple when you see something. There is a things to be seen and the I sensitivity to see it. And the seeing consciousness. So on our part, we have the eye sensitivity, retina, and seeing consciousness. They have different, different, uh, different nature. So though the act of seeing is composed of many different moments of small mental state, 
Normally, we do not think of it that way. We take it as just one thing I see or it is seen. And also, we take it as just one thing I hear, I smell, I taste, etc. Because we take each process to be one solid thing. We take a uh, complex things. We take a uh, we take a uh, process of process as a mass. And as long as we cannot break this mass into its components, we always think in terms of I or a person or an individual. And there are also different functions performed by different mental states. Seeing as an example, seeing consciousness has a function of seeing, hearing consciousness has a function of hearing, smelling consciousness has a function of smelling, etc. And also, Sampadejana receiving consciousness has a function of receiving. Investi investigating consciousness has a function of investigating. And a number of other mental states which arise and disappear after fulfilling their various functions in processing that one object. But we are not able to see these mental states and processes when Yogi pay attention, just the seeing, you know, it is hearing, and another hearing, and then touching. We must observe carefully. If we cannot analyze the sea into different mental states, performing their respective function, I see or a person see is what we normally understand. And there is different in the way of different types of consciousness. Take different objects. One type of consciousness takes a visible object and seeing consciousness takes sound as an, as an object, and smelling consciousness takes smell as object, and so on. Different objects. But we just assume that it is one consciousness that takes this object. We assume that the I, I, I see is also the uh, I hear, etc. So if we do not see the difference in the way mental state takes objects, we cannot shake off the notion that it is one compact I who see it is one solid I who hear, who smell, and so on. So anatta non-self is concealed by compactness. In order to understand anatta, we need to understand the meaning of anatta. 
Well, meaning is having no exercise of authority over it. Another meaning so anatta is having no core. Anatta is that which has no inner core, no essence, and no self. As long as we take things to be compact, to be a mass, or to be just one solid things with many functions, we can avoid the notion that there is a core or there is an inherent essence or a self. To understand the another nature of the her things, we need to break things down into elements and their different components. As long as yogi cannot resolve things into their constituent parts, yogi will always think of them as one compact things. But once Yogi are able to analyze and resolve them into their various components, the notion of compactness and the notion of self, the notion of Atta are gone. So in order to see Anatta non-self, it is very important that Yogi break things down Yogi need to cut, aggregates into pieces, and Yogi need to analyze aggregates with strong concentration, mindfulness, and with personal knowledge. So Abhinama teaching is all about Nata. Although Abhidhamma does not say that it is, there is anatta, that is anatta, Abhidhamma tells us that everything is anatta because everything is minutely analyzed. Jaita, mind is analyzed into uh, consciousness and mental factors, then consciousness is analyzed into 121 types, and the mental factors are analyzed into 52 types, and so on. So everything is so minutely analyzed in order to show that there's no compactness, there's no core. in our body, in, the, in these aggregates. So the whole of Abhidhamma teaching is always pointing to the anatta nature of things, although we learn many other things from it. Everything can be analyzed into components because nothing is compact. Since there is no compactness in anything, there can be no core, there can be no other. It is not a solid body, not a single body. When practicing Vipassana meditation, Yogi make notes of objects that appear at the present moment, and Yogi see that at every moment, every moment of objects are different. And when you take mental states as objects, you know that there are man many mental states, not just one compact mind, 
So Yogi are able to resolve mind into many components. A yogi may not be able to name those components, but yogi see them and understand them. And it is more important to be able to resolve objects into component states then it is to give names to them. During the practice of meditation, Yogi will see that your mind is not just one mind. At different moments, there is a different mind or different consciousness. One consciousness goes to an object another consciousness makes note of it, then these two disappear, another consciousness that is thinking of quite another things arises and disappear, etc. So when yogi pay close attention to what is happening in the aggregates in your mind, Yogi will see that what you thought to be one compact thing is actually composed of many small different mental states. Once Yogi see mind as comprising these small mental states, Yogi, we, yogi come to understand that there is no core in the mind. When Yogi see there is no core in the mind, Yogi see the anatta nature of that mind that aggregates. Now Yogi understand the three characteristics of all conditioned phenomena. The characteristics are impermanence and nature, characteristics of suffering, dukkha, and characteristics of non-self or no core anatta. And the sub-commentary of Visodhi Mega says, these three characteristics are not included in the aggregates because they are states without individual essence. This means that three characteristics are just a mode of conditioned phenomena, but not, con not conditioned phenomena, so they are not included in the aggregates. And sub-commentary says, the three characteristics are not separate from the aggregates. Because three characteristics cannot be apprehended without the aggregates. Without the aggregates, we cannot see the three characteristics. So three characteristics are not included in the aggregates, but they are not separate from the aggregates. They are three characteristics are concept applying to these modes of easy communication. And the three characteristics are not paramata, not ultimate reality. but the uh, attributes of ultimate reality, attributes of the aggregates. They are neither included in the aggregates nor are they separate from them because they cannot be understood without the aggregates. 
without calling them something. We cannot talk about them without something. So they are called concepts. We are given names for identification. Three characteristics are connected with the aggregates, and in Pali they are called pinyati. That means particular mode of expression. So it is to see these three characteristics that we practice vipassana meditation. We will see the three characteristics only when we practice continuously and precisely, not just by saying, oh, it is impermanent, it is suffering, it is not self, again and again. We must practice. Three characteristics can be understood only when we practice diligently, not by repeating the words, or just thinking about them. So if we want to see the three characteristics, we must practice vipassana diligently. It is important. So when we practice vipassana, in the beginning try to see, try to uh, develop concentration in order to make our mind steady, still, and free from mental hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and toba, etc. Mental hindrances to be free. Then when your mind is free from mental hindrances, concentration comes to you. Through concentration, yogi begin to see aggregates clearly. Yogi begin to see them separately. Yogi begin to see aggregates or namarupa occurring at the same time as a pair. Yogi see the rising, rising abdomen and mindfulness of the abdomen. Or yogi see the in-breath and the mindfulness of in-breath. Yogi see the out-breath and mindfulness of out-breath. So these namarupa, these things, yogi see separately, not mixed with one another. After seeing that, yogi will also see conditionality Yogi will see that because of the rising abdomen, there is mindfulness of the abdomen. Because there is the intention to stretch, there is stretching. So stretching, you can see two things. One is intention and one is stretching. And then yogi will see objects arise and disappear. Because yogi trying to uh, observe continuously and every arising you capture it. And of course, disappearing also you, you, you see it. So when yogi see the Aggregates arise and disappear. Yogi see the impermanent nature of the aggregates. When Yogi see the impermanent nature of the aggregates, Yogi also see their dukkha nature. Because when Yogi see them arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing, you come to the understanding that the five aggregates or namarupa are bombarded and oppressed by arising and disappearing. 
continuous oppression by rising and disappearing is what is meant by dukkha suffering. And when you see the impermanent nature and suffering nature of uh, the aggregates, Yogi can also see the anatta nature. Yogi see things arising and disappearing, which means there is no core in them. If they are one core in them, they would last forever. They would be together and intact. But now, you observe closely and they are separate. And they are continuously arising and disappearing. So there is no unifying core in them. And moreover, Yogi cannot tell them to stop. Yogi cannot tell them not to arise and not to disappear. There's no way you can exercise any authority over the aggregates. So here, Yogi is seeing the another nature of things. Through the practice of vipassana meditation and through paying close attention to the objects at the present moment, Yogi can discover nature, dukkha, anatta for yourself. Once you see these three characteristics for yourself, you don't have to base your faith on what other people say. Through your own experience, you can verify that The teaching of the Buddha are correct. The teaching of the all Namarupa are impermanent. They are correct. And through your own experience, you can verify that the teaching of the Buddha are correct. When you see this for yourself and come to this firm understanding, Nobody can shake you away from this understanding. This understanding becomes your very own property, your very own knowledge. So it is to possess this knowledge that we practice vipassana meditation. And we practice meditation and we see the aggregates, we see our body disintegrate into particles. We see our body disappear. Actually not, uh, it is uh, not complete yet. Even though we see our body disintegrating, we still uh, be thinking, oh, what is, what are the, what are the, the uh, what are, what this body disintegrating? It is I, who see it, so we may think in this way, this is I who see. So with regard to the mental state, we must see another nature also. Only when we see both Nama and Rupa of our aggregates, as arising and disappearing at every moment, 
we can say that we have seen the another nature. So we must understand that the real understanding of another nature comes only when we pay close attention to both our minor matter, our fire aggregates, and see them as arising and disappearing, see them as being oppressed by arising and disappearing, and having no control over it, as having no core, and so on. So it is important to see these three characteristics. So let us practice Vipassana meditation for a few minutes. <laughs> 